We're just going to be going through debugging your smart contracts with Foundry. We'll be walking through some of like the cast utilities and the debugger um, if they fix the issue with the debugger um, in the past couple of weeks. So this is something that you're going to see pretty often on some block explorers, especially if they're block explorers like Block Scout, um, where sometimes the internal transactions aren't being parsed correctly. So you'll just see that your contract is failing or the transaction is failing when you're calling a contract, and it's just not going to tell you why. Uh, which is not ideal. Um, so if you want to get started, if you can get your laptop out and you can download the installer over here, so you can just curl the Foundry installer and then execute it. It takes like a minute to do. Uh, it's pretty quick. Uh, it's a really, really great framework. Uh, you don't even like have to use it for everything. I would just even just use it for debugging if you want to use something more simple like Remix to write your contract and if you're a complete like noob to this, right? Um, so while people are getting that set up and getting this installed, who am I? I'm a back-end engineer at Mantle Network. Um, I'll be at the booth if you guys need any help, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, Twitter, afk 0 byte Telegram, afk byte And you can check out my GitHub as well. Um, profile picture and everything is that wooden plank, uh, fairly recognizable. Um, so what is Foundry to begin with? So Foundry is a modular like smart contract development framework. It's got four components. You can use CAST, which is CLI tools that interact directly with the chain, which is what I find really useful for debugging. Um, you've got Anvil, which is a local test node, um, like the hard hat node, if that makes sense, except this is like much faster than hard hat node. I highly recommend that you use this over the hard hat node if you want to run like simulations or anything. Um, you have Chisel, which is like a, it's an encoding library. You're not going to have to use it if you're like brand new, but it's pretty useful to have. And then we have Forge, which is what most people are probably the most familiar with here. It's a smart contract testing and scripting slash compilation a library. Very, very useful. Um, highly recommend that you use this over hard hat. Um, so Anvil, which is pretty important, it's basically just a faster hard hat node. So you can just fork any network um, at any at latest or at any specified height. So let's say that you have deployed your contract on mainnet or you've deployed your contract on Mantle, which is where I work, and um, you get an error. What you can do is you can actually fork the local state of the network. Pretty useful. So you can see the instruction over there. It's like Anvil dash dash fork URL. As long as you put like an RPC URL over there, uh, you can fork the state of that network. Um, if you want to put an additional argument, um, you can also put like block height uh, dash dash block dash height, and then put the exact block you want to fork at if you want to get the state at a particular block. But I think that if you want to get the state from a block that's a bit further back, it's going to have to be an archive note that you're pulling from. Uh, for Mantle, our RPC testnet, like that URL is an archive note, so you can pull arbitrary state from however many blocks back that you want. Um, so when um, you are um, testing on a fork of mainnet instead of like mainnet itself, your call traces are going to be more detailed. You can see what functions are sort of being executed um, by your contract call, even if they are in remote contracts. Um, it's not really mandatory. Again, you can use hard hat note instead. I just recommend this because it's much faster and the traces are much more detailed. Um, and then cast. This is the second part. I highly recommend scanning this um, to be able to go over to the docs and sort of take a look. Um, so it's a nice command line um, tool for interacting with EVM-based chains if you want to like send transactions or do anything like that. So um, you can cast call, cast send, which is what you can use to broadcast arbitrary static calls um, or transactions, cast call being the static call, cast send being like a transaction. Um, you can cast ABI decode, cast ABI uh, encode. If you want to decode or encode call data, uh, like to transmit to chain, or like if you want to encode or decode your own transaction, there's cast transaction, cast block, which means that you can just pull arbitrary information uh, about like a transaction or a block uh, from chain. So this is really useful when combined with forking off mainnet, right? Because you can get information about a transaction that has already occurred on chain or about a whole block that has already been mined on chain, if that makes sense. There's cast storage. This is a little bit more complicated. If you know the exact storage slot of like a variable um, that you want to like pull information from, you can use that, the, uh, the ad contract address and the, the storage address within that contract to just pull the value out of storage over there, um, and you can cast RPC. So if you have like an RPC endpoint, you can use this command line tool to just straight up send um, like RPC calls to any um, RPC endpoint that conforms to the, the Ethereum RPC spec, if that makes sense. So yeah. When we're using cast run, it's like the most useful thing for debugging, honestly. You can run it against a local fork to debug transactions. So basically, you can decode function calls even if the contract is like unverified. It's got like pretty good error tracing. So for example, on a block explorer, um, that error that pops up, 
might just be unknown error, sort of like you saw uh, at the beginning of the talk, right? Um, when you fork it and you run it like this, and you have the source contract code, it'll decode it. it you can see that, oh, hey, this um, transaction failed uh, because the error, A, must be greater than B, if that makes sense. So like much more helpful. Um, note that this is only if you um, have string errors. If you use the custom function errors, it'll be an ABI encoded version of the error. So it'll be like the first four bytes of the, of the hash of your error. Um, and then like whatever arguments are in it. So if you're just starting out, I highly recommend you just use string errors. Um, it makes it easier to debug in situations like this rather than custom errors, even though custom errors are more idiomatic. We're at a hackathon, we're experimenting with new technology. Uh, we wanna do it like the easiest way possible, right? Yeah, so that's basically uh, it for the talk. We went through it like pretty quickly because we had like a very short amount of time. Uh, I'm gonna go through a live demo of this and then you guys can ask any questions that you have. Um, if you want, or actually, do you guys have any questions now about like the utilities that are uh, given by CAST and everything? Yep. Yeah, I have a question about this. Yes. So you have to run it with some specific arguments. So if you see um, over here, um, you see um, if you just run Anvil, it'll start from a zero zero state. So let me do that right now. Sorry, this is, has a lot of history in it because I was doing stuff. Yeah. What? Oh yes, I will make it bigger. Sorry. Uh, I already have an Anvil instance running. Oh God. Um, somewhere. Let's just close all of my terminals. Oh yes, I already had an Anvil instance running. My bad. Let me get rid of that. Oh, my bad. It's actually over here. Um, so. I have one that's been running for the whole night because I was doing some work and debugging a bunch of things. But as you can see, um, when you're like sending transactions to it, like you can start it at like its starting state. So if you go like, just run the instruction Anvil, what happens is you have a blockchain with like no state, it, like nothing sort of happens. And if you want to like pull um, transactions and stuff like that from it. So for example, I'm using cast send over here. Um, you can see that there's like some preloaded addresses with ETH and stuff within them. Um, so I can cast send this address, some amount of ether um, with the private key sort of specified. Um, that's all being pulled off the preloaded accounts over here. Um, I can just do the cast send. I get like the information about the transaction back. Uh, it gets mined over here and now suddenly that address um, has ether and stuff in it. Um, so it's useful for testing from a blank slate. And then if you wanna like test from an actual like block chain, so you can go Anvil and then you go RPC URL and then you can grab any RPC URL you want. Uh, we're gonna use Mantle, because that's the company I work for. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot of URLs. So you could just go like go Mantle RPC URL. You can use the public one if you want. Um, um, you shouldn't get rate limited. Uh, and if you do get rate limited, what I would do is I would use um, the blast nodes one. Those are generally pretty good. But yeah, all you need to do is not have those arbitrary characters over there, but uh, put this in after. And then suddenly um, you have blockchain state. It's been cloned from here. So what I can do over here is I can go to the testnet URL um, and let's go to the testnet explorer. Testnet explorer and then pull some arbitrary contract from it, right? So this is some arbitrary contract. There's some transactions within it, right? Um, so yeah, let's just take this transaction hash. Uh, we can run things like, we can just rerun the transaction like I showed in the presentation sort of over here. We run the argument um, cast run, uh, and then you use a dash dash for both to get the full trace. Uh, we can go back over here, go into the second tab over here. We can go cast run. And do you see the transaction, that hash that I pulled from the block the chain explorer? Yeah, it just will run it. Um, and then it'll tell you exactly what error, if it was a string error um, that sort of occurred, right? Um, again, this can be done on any test network any mainnet, as long as they conform to the RPC, and as long as it's like an archive node, if you're using a non-archive node RPC for this, you could only pull like detailed history from like I think 200 blocks back or so. Um, but yeah, uh, any more questions? 
You can also query the RPC directly, but you might get rate limited. So I find it better to like fork state and then query off of that. Uh, it's also, if you query the RPC directly, you won't get as detailed of a trace, if that makes sense, because it returns more limited information compared to what's exposed in Anvil. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. To spin up? 20 seconds. Um, yeah, 20 seconds. Um, I've had like on really bad internet before, have it taken a lot more time, but yeah, normally 20 seconds. And again, if you have any issues with like forking like the testnet or like mainnet, what you can also do is you can just c construct the state that you want over here. Um, so let's say that you want like a certain state to be set up within it. You can just like write a script or something to send the transactions to Anvil to make sure that your contract is at a certain state, deploy your contract on Anvil and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you can like start querying state and stuff from there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, you can also do like RPC calls, if that makes sense. So this is like, oh, I wanted to get block 498 on my local fork, if that makes sense, see what transactions and stuff are in it. Um, you can also use this as like a mock backend. Uh, I, big, I actually highly recommend that unless a prize that you have requires that you deploy on mainnet when you're demoing, use this as a mock backend because then you don't have to wait for blocks to be mined and stuff like that. Anvil on its default mode, um, what ends up happening is it just automatically mines every time you send a transaction. So again, like I can go cast send the ETH over there, uh, and it just will instantaneously confirm. So you don't have to wait like however long it takes for a transaction to confirm. Yep. Uh, it does work for out of gas errors. So normally when you get an out of gas error, you just get like a revert exception and then like some num numerical code. Um, yeah, and then when you're doing it over here, it'll tell you like out of gas and you can use the, the forge like debugger to trace through to see where exactly you're running out of gas. Um, I think that the Forge debugger does work on the latest version of Foundry Forge, but I would just take a look at, like, through the docs. You can literally like step through your contract, see how much gas is consumed at each step, uh, and it'll work from there. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I also recommend print line debugging. Yeah, big fan. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I guess that's sort of it. We ran through it kind of quickly, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, I'll be at the Mantle booth. I'll also wait behind um, so we can go through more detailed examples if you want. I wasn't able to go through everything because I arrived late. Sorry again for that, everyone. But yeah, this is a really, really useful utility. Um, when, I was like new, when I was new to Solidity, I really wish that we had something like this and not like Truffle or yeah, Hard Hat. This just has made debugging significantly easier and like being able to like trace and go into specific things much, much easier, effectively. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.